Hello all, if you haven't been here before, my name is Julie. Welcome to my channel. I typically make content surrounding the three main topics, those being mental health, makeup, as well as music. Today I'm coming at you with a mental health video which is very personal. It's about my mental health and my struggles and things I have gone through. As the title says, I have agoraphobia. You may or may not have heard of this before. It is classified as a severe anxiety disorder that prevents you from going to public or crowded places and some people with a severe case of this illness are homebound, meaning that they cannot leave their house. So my history with this mental health issue is that my symptoms began to persist probably around late 2013. They were not impairing my functioning as much, but I was starting to notice that I was more withdrawn and isolated and avoiding going out more than I had in the past. Toward the end of 2013, I endured an event that I'm not going to get into, but my body and brain process it as a trauma, and I feel that it contributed to the development of my agoraphobia. I also, and will not get into detail with this at the moment, struggled with some disordered eating, and I was at the peak of my worsened symptoms with that, and I think that not eating enough and not taking care of yourself enough can also cause a lot of anxiety for you, and so I feel that that contributed as well. In January of 2014, I began having panic attacks every single day, sometimes twice a day, and these panic attacks were very severe and definitely impaired me and affected my functioning. They were so debilitating that I could barely leave the house, although I was able to go to work, which is very interesting because I worked at an elementary school, which is somewhat of a crowded place, but I was accommodated by my boss and I was shielded from triggering events like going to school-wide assemblies. So I was very lucky that they accommodated me there. I never really had panic attacks and needed to leave my place of employment back then. But in 2014, that began to become an issue here and there. But my again, my work was very accommodating. If I needed to leave, I left and there were no complaints, no discrimination. There were no issues with that. For me, the most major concern was that my panic attacks and severe anxiety was persisting at school. I was attending community college and I would take one class on campus and one class online at the time. It was really hard to be in a classroom, especially around my peers. Social anxiety is definitely a factor that plays into my agoraphobia, so dealing with both of those aspects can be very difficult. If you have not seen my social anxiety video, I will link it down below. Please check it out so that you can get more clarification on what my social anxiety looks like if you are interested in hearing more about it. I remember I went to class one day and I got there early and I don't know what it was, but there was one girl in there and she was a really nice girl. There was no issues, but I just started having a panic attack and she said, it's okay, I'll tell the teacher you need to leave, whatnot. And I also had disability services at the time, so I was able to go over there. And it was really embarrassing because one time I had a panic attack that was so bad, I had to go in a separate room to try to calm down. And the dean of the school, it was her office, so she actually came in and helped to de-escalate me which is very unexpected, but she was so wonderful about it. And I highly recommend community college to people or specifically the community college I attended because they were so accommodating about my struggles and never looked down on me or judged me for it whatsoever. And I feel very grateful for that experience. Despite having panic attacks at school, I continued to pursue my education somewhat on campus because I knew that it was important for me to push through these symptoms and not completely avoid. I, however, struggled more and more with my agoraphobia symptoms and decided to do the rest of my undergraduate studies online starting in the summer of 2015. I finished up my associate's degree online and then completed the rest of my bachelor's degree online. And this persisted into my graduate studies, which is why I chose a low residency program. Ideally, I wanted to do an online program entirely, but I could not find one that suited my needs. So I decided to do this low residency program and again push myself because although it was mostly online and somewhat accommodated my needs, I was also going on campus a few times a year and I knew that that was an important fear for me to face because it's something that in life I'm gonna have to deal with. I have to go out and I have to do things. No matter who you are, you have to face those things. Getting into my panic attacks, they have been a lot better throughout the years, but they used to be really severe. I used to black out, I used to scream unintentionally, go into the fetal position. It 
was really embarrassing and really impaired my functioning. And you can imagine that if I was having those episodes in public places that I wouldn't wanna to go to public places out of fear of having that happen because it was debilitating for me to go through. And it was also embarrassing if people that didn't know me witnessed me having that because they may not understand what's happening and they may say something that triggered me worse. So I wasn't homebound. Like I said, I could go to work and I could go to school even though the panic attacks persisted. I never got to the point where I completely could not leave my house and I'm very grateful for that. However, at one point, the only places I could drive to were work and therapy, which were local. I could not drive anywhere else. So this limited me in relationships with friends, going to events, things like that. I also live near Boston, although I live in the suburbs and I went to a concert in 2015 in Boston. And after that, I just could not do it anymore. And I didn't go into Boston at all for a concert or any event or any situation whatsoever until 2019. I went to see Water Parks, which is my favorite band with my boyfriend. And I did really well and was really surprised and happy with myself, but my progress has taken time. I could barely go out to eat at restaurants. I couldn't even go to the gas station by myself. I couldn't even just sit in the car and wait, let alone get out of the car. These symptoms were very severe and persisted into all areas of my life and deeply affect affected how I was functioning. I would use apps to try to meet friends, but I would end up freezing up and being too terrified to meet them in person, which ties into social anxiety, but also the agoraphobia because I didn't want to admit to people I had agoraphobia because most of the time when I have in the past, people have said, oh, well, I wanna go out and do things, so I don't wanna be friends with someone who barely goes out. Probably not the person for me. I do wanna compromise and go places, but I'm not a spontaneous person. I need to plan things in advance and mentally prepare myself to attend an event if it's something out of my comfort zone. However, it's still something that I will attempt to pursue because again, I know that that's important for my well-being and recovery. I couldn't even go to the grocery store or the mall or run errands or all those things that if I had lived on my own, I would have crashed and burn. I, I was very lucky at the time to live at home and not need to fulfill those responsibilities. I couldn't even attend family gatherings for a long time. And there are other aspects of that, but definitely the crowd. Part of being in a crowd for me is I feel out of place and I feel like I don't belong and I feel insignificant in the world, which may sound silly because maybe logically I am, but emotionally I don't want to identify that way or feel that way because that's uncomfortable for me. Um, so I think that's what helped with going to water parks because everyone there was a fan and so am I obviously. So I felt like I belonged. I also the, last year did a suicide walk for the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. And again, I'm a mental health advocate. I'm in the field. So I felt like I belonged and the people were really kind and nice. I didn't feel uncomfortable in that environment. And I really surprised myself with how well I did in that setting. Other persistent symptoms within my agoraphobia are overstimulation and noise sensitivity. So overstimulation is kind of similar to the sensory overload that happens to people on the autism spectrum, I would say. It may not be as severe, but what happens is that I go out, I'm in public, I hear all this noise, I'm exposed to all of these draining situations, whether it's socializing with people or there's just a lot going on at once. There's a kid crying, there's music playing, a waiter is talking to me, my family's having multiple conversations at the same time, and I go home and feel like my head's gonna explode and I have all this nervous energy and can't sit still or calm myself and sometimes I need a day or two at a time to recover and come back from that. So it takes me a little longer to come back than it might for someone who doesn't have this mental health issue. The noise sensitivity also makes it hard to listen to music or watch TV sometimes, although throughout the years this has progressively gotten better because it's something I've been actively working on. For example, my boyfriend loves to get out of the house if he's feeling overwhelmed. He loves to listen to music, watch TV or YouTube, play his guitar, all noisy and somewhat overstimulating things. And I only ask him to take a break from that if I'm really overwhelmed. And even if I'm anxious, I try to push myself to accommodate his needs, but also gradually expose myself to those things so that I can progress with the symptom, with my symptom severity. I would say the main aspect of agoraphobia is the avoidance behaviors. If I do not feel like going out, I do not. I try to push myself some days, but I know my limits and I know a day where I just cannot leave the house. The less exposure I get, the more likely my symptoms are going to persist and become more severe. So it has been hard um, not being at my internship anymore and not working for a while because I'm not leaving the house as much. And I'll wake up in the morning and have a persistent fear of leaving the house and freeze up and I won't leave the house for a couple days at a time. But again, this is something that I'm aware of and it's something that I'm working on and I'm attempting to challenge and I'm not giving up on that. 
This has also affected traveling for me. My school is two hours away and that's been really difficult for me, although I've been able to cope with it, but I haven't gone on a vacation in four years because the last vacation I went on wasn't too far away and I had a pretty bad panic attack. My issue with traveling isn't just recent. I did talk to my mom about my childhood and if there were any signs of um, anxiety and things like that back then and she told me I always had trouble traveling especially when there weren't plans or I didn't know where I was eating or I didn't know where I was going if I was far away. So I never really identified with enjoying traveling but I'm wondering if I would if these symptoms didn't persist and that it doesn't have to do with an interest. And it is something I wanna work on and pursue but I can't afford it and I don't have the time right now but one day I will. This has negatively affected my life because I've missed out on so many great concerts, so many cool events, so many opportunities to expand my career and personal growth, as well as making new friends, meeting new people, pursuing relationships and aspects like that. Although I'm very grateful that apps have worked for me. That's how I met my boyfriend. That's how I met a lot of my friends. And I have some very strong, healthy relationships now. So although it took time, I believe that good things will come to you as long as you work toward your goals. And that can be hard, but you need to just take baby steps and take it day by day. So now getting into the thoughts that make the symptoms of agoraphobia persist for me, I did write out a couple that I feel like happen often. These are including, what if I run into someone I know? Perhaps they don't like me. What if someone yells at me or hurts my feelings? What if I have a panic attack and need to go home? Part of agoraphobia is worrying you don't have an escape out of a situation. What if someone doesn't like me? What if someone makes me feel uncomfortable? What if someone makes fun of me? What if I don't feel safe? What if I embarrass myself? What if something bad happens? So these are all what if thoughts. They are a mix of intrusive thoughts. They're a mix of worry thoughts. They are ruminating because sometimes I hear them over and over and over. That can be difficult to deal with, but it's really important to take a step back when it comes to anxiety and agoraphobia. And we learn this in CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's about thought stopping. It's about being aware enough to say, okay, I'm having this thought, but is it really me? Is this a thought that's bound in evidence, in logic, or is this associated with my strong emotions and anxiety and easier said than done. It takes a lot of practice to do that. I feel like identifying the thoughts and being aware of the thoughts and working on thought stopping is the first step in CBT before attempting to challenge the thoughts, but challenging them is important as well. I'm kind of delving into treatment options for agoraphobia right now because I don't want this video to just be, oh, here's my story. I went through all this stuff. I struggled. It's awful. I want to instill hope in others who may be dealing with this mental health issue or other mental health issues that with treatment, effort, and time, things will get better and be patient with yourself. There are intensive treatment options for agoraphobia and other mental illnesses and that might be a good fit for you or it might not and that's okay. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to see small bits of progress over time and celebrate those victories and successes. Moving forward, so the evidence-based treatment, the gold standard treatment for agoraphobia is exposure therapy, which is an aspect of CBT. You will be able to find videos on here about that and there are some clinicians that do it. As I said, there are intensive options for this. I have written some papers for school on agoraphobia since obviously it's a clinical interest because it's something I face and it's a population of clients I would love to work with because I totally understand what it's like and I'm interested in improving my own symptoms as well as helping other people to do the same thing. So exposure I believe works best for me when gradual. One, I have to be willing for it and up to it. Two, I have to start small. You do a fear hierarchy, right? So you say, okay, for me, maybe I can go for a walk. I start there, I can go for a walk and then I can run an errand, be in and out of a store. And then maybe the next level is I can go out to eat. And then, you know, higher up might be a concert and that might be something I have to work toward. Like I'm going to see My Chemical Romance in September and that is gonna be the biggest crowd I've been in in years. But obviously it aligns with my values and interests. It's important to me. It's important to the people that I care about that I'm going to be with at this concert and I have plenty of time to prepare for it. So I feel like it's a realistic goal. So goal setting within the fear hierarchy and planning what you're going to do for your treatment I feel are really important aspects. To improve your experience in exposure therapy, it's really important to learn relaxation and grounding techniques. And again, easier said than done. And I absolutely admit that I have trouble mastering these and it's much easier when a clinician leads me through it than when I try to do it on my own. There are a lot of options on apps for guided meditations and things like that, but you have to find what works for you because you may be presented with all these treatment options and maybe only one or two things work and that's okay. As long as you can find the things that work for you, that's the most important aspect. Another cool treatment 
option for agoraphobia I wrote a paper about is virtual reality therapy. Um, they also have this for veterans who have PTSD and it is evidence-based. There was a good amount of research I found about it. Unfortunately, it's tough with insurance and it, from what I know, it's not here for the most part, but I hope that one day it will be because it's a cool option. Unfortunately, I have motion sickness and I'm sure other people do, so it may not be an option for me, but if you do not, it is something to be excited for and consider. Also, when I took abnormal psychology in undergrad, we watched a video about an old woman who was homebound and her clinician in her played a game online where she went to the grocery store in the game and he helped her. And then it was so heartwarming because she actually went to the grocery store, was picking up her groceries, had a smile on her face and seemed to be doing great. I really hope that if you are struggling with agoraphobia, you feel less alone from this video. I know it's really hard to find other people out there who struggle. There are support groups out there I hope that you have access to these. I hope that you find people that you're comfortable talking about it with because no one should have to go through mental health issues alone. I, if this video helped one person, then it made all the difference for me and it was important for me to make it. So if you've came here because you have agoraphobia and you relate to me and you like mental health videos and maybe other aspects of my channel, please feel free to stick around. Another aspect I'd like to instill hope in for you is if you have mental illness, it doesn't mean you can't go into the mental health field. I would say it's up to your personal opinion and preference if it's something you're passionate about, but I never thought this was something that I would be doing and I was just accepted for an internship in an outpatient therapy setting and I'm going to learn so much and they even might offer a job afterward if it's something I enjoy. Moral of the story, don't give up on your dreams. You're capable of more than you think and take your time and be kind to yourself. Treat yourself how you would treat a friend. Self-love is really important. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you've enjoyed my content so far. I would love to have you. Please leave a comment talking about if you know anyone with agoraphobia or if you have it yourself, if not, Anxiety is very similar and I'd love for you to share what anxiety has been like for you. Also, treatment options. Please express what things have helped you in your mental health journey to improve your symptoms and what progress you've noticed you've experienced over time. That's all I have for you today. Bye guys!